Welcome everyone, Christine here with a discussion about the Warriors of Chaos in Total War Warhammer 3, one of the most powerful races in the game. But what makes them so incredibly potent in both battle and on the campaign map that they can steamroll the map from turn 1? Let me make this very clear. The moment you start the Warriors of Chaos campaign, you have won that campaign. You will not lose that campaign. You might be slowed down, but the chances of you actually losing a campaign are effectively zero unless you deliberately seek to lose it. And even then, you would have to try really, really hard to actually end up on the defeat screen. Now, to be fair, losing a campaign um, isn't necessarily about losing all your territory. It's about getting in an impossible situation from which you have no solution. That is certainly not something that's going to happen for the Warriors of Chaos in any of their campaigns, even some of the more difficult ones. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the Mono Gods or if we talk, we're talking about the Undivided. To be clear, however, Undivided is significantly more powerful. While you are going to lack some of the unique powers that the Mono Gods do have, and they certainly have them, the level of versatility that you have as Undivided, the fact that you have all of the Gifts of Chaos from all the Gods, gives you a significant level of strength in campaign and battle. It allows you to deal with pretty much any situation that you might, might encounter in a campaign very effectively. Now, one of the things that makes the Warriors of Chaos really powerful, and over here, Belakor Albion, um, is vassalization. So over here, I vassalized Malice Darkblade, Yanbo, and Grimgor, also the minor Norskan vassal that Belakor can get early on in this campaign. It would be nice if the Dark Fortress was over here, but... That's, a, uh, that's my perspective. Regardless, so I have several vassals, incredibly powerful vassals at that, like Yon, Bo, Grimgor, and Malice Darkblade are ridiculously powerful vassals. It's going to take some time for them to build up from the beating that I gave them. Well, minus Grimgor, because I didn't have to find Grimgor. You have two options when it comes to vassalization. The Tomb Kings, for instance, can vassalize through diplomacy, and that's exactly what I did with Grimgor here. So I took this element sold it to him, he agreed to become my vassal, then I trade the Dial of White for the Great Ogum uh, in this campaign, got the Dark Fortress, got Grimgor as a vassal, and, well, let's just say Bretonia is in for a really, really bad time soon enough if I do decide to invade them. But that's one way. But that's not unique to the Warriors of Chaos. What is unique to the Warriors of Chaos in Akari is subjugation. So the way subjugation works is that if you reduce a faction to its last element, then you attack that element, effectively take it over, then you can subjugate the faction. And basically you're forcing vassalization on them. That's what I did for Malice Darkblade and Yanbo. I fought these two. I defeated these two. And keep in mind, fighting and defeating Malice Darkblade as any legendary lord is certainly not necessarily an easy task. I'm kind of curious how he got Black Guard of Nagarond. Well, uh, the vassals you get from subjugation will get the free army, so I'm guessing it's because of that. I suppose not entirely certain, but I imagine that it's simply because of the army they got there uh, for uh, for free. Yanbo hasn't kept uh, any of the troops, but regardless, uh, regardless that subjugation power is very significant because while trading away territory for factions can work in vassalization is significantly more powerful. It means that you can go to a war with a faction, get a lot of money, get a lot of experience, get a lot of settlements, force vassalization on them, and then sell a bunch of the settlements you took back to them, make a ton of money. Which is certainly one of the things that I've been doing in this campaign. Keep in mind that Warriors accounts don't hold a lot of territory themselves, so their economy early on can be a bit limited. But they are certainly one of those races that grow stronger the more you play them in a campaign. Significantly more strong, uh, stronger. And even early on, they're certainly not easy to deal with. Because while early on you may only be able to afford one army, over here I'm going bankrupt with just two armies. While early on they may only effectively be, be able to afford one army, that army they, they do have is one of the strongest early game armies they, uh, that you can get in the game. It certainly lacks the flexibility that having multiple army get, uh, armies early on gives you in a campaign because you can take more territory quickly. The vassals kind of make up for it, but uh, not quite completely. 
So there's a significant level of power, but it's not necessarily so much early game. It's more so later on in a, in a campaign. Though Bellicor is pretty damn strong from the very beginning of the campaign, so is Valkia. It's because of their Legendary Lord design. Some of them are slower to become really powerful, others start incredibly powerful. Bellicor is certainly one of those that starts in a fairly strong position early on. But the vassalization aspect is just one part of it. The second part is that tied together to vassals, you only need, you only care about Dark Fortresses in your campaign. So Dark Fortresses are special settlements that the Warriors of Chaos can occupy. And the reason Dark Fortresses are so incredible is, well, they have really powerful garrisons. The Tier 1 garrison with uh, uh, Chaos Warriors, Marauders with Grey Weapons, and an Exalted Hero is certainly a fairly strong garrison. The Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4 garrisons become ridiculous. Like, this is a Tier 3 sound, it doesn't have the garrison building. There's no reason ever to build the garrison building as Warriors of Chaos. The AI is going to be very skittish at attacking fortified settlements, and they're especially skittish with Dark Fortresses because, well, there's... 12 units as part of this garrison. Ignore the Dark Elf units that you might see here because that's from Malice Darkblade. The majority of the units that uh, you see over here, they are from the garrison itself. So 12 units. And not weak units either. You have armored castrols, you've got Wars cast, you have an exalted hero. Sure, you still have Marauders, but like once I get this element to tier 4, things are going to become even crazier. And eventually you get Chosen in a garrison. Chosen are the most powerful infantry units in the game. You don't get Chosen with Grey Weapons. That would make it insanely powerful. But you do get Chosen regardless in a garrison. And it's not just the garrison itself. It's also the fact that Dark Fortresses are some of the most defensible settlements in a campaign of any settlements in the game. Because of their layout, because the the tower placement out on the walls, because of how the streets are designed inside the walls. Like, most of the time when I'm talking about sieges in Warhammer 3, most sieges are cakewalk. Like, if you're an attacker, you show up with a full stack against the garrison, it is fairly easy to win. Or maybe not so easy, but you will win without losing. Like, the chance of losing uh, in a siege attacker situation against a siege is very rare. Typically, it might happen when there's a full army beyond the garrison. But the thing about Dark Fortress is, because of their layout, because of the units that are defending them, because of the wall placements, they're the most difficult sieges for an attacker in the entire game. Bar none. So, they have powerful units in the garrison... They have a lot of strength because of the layout. They're the only sieges in the game that are actually worth um, fighting on the defensive if an, uh, an AI attacker shows up. Because you might just be able to win. The towers the Warriors of Chaos have on both the walls and inside the settlements are pretty powerful. The layout makes it very defensive. You can hold up significant forces, assuming the AI even attacks you. They're so impregnable. Like, most of the time when I'm playing against Warriors of Chaos, I take out their army, replenish then not resolve against their Dark Fortresses. I really, really do not want to attack a Dark Fortress directly in a manual battle because it is going to be a brutal slog, even if I have an overwhelming advantage. It's that kind of situation. It's what I'd call the Draika effect. What do I mean by that? Well, Draika is a really powerful Legendary Lord of the Wood Elves. And the way you beat Draika is you don't fight her directly. If you fight a manual battle against Rika, she will likely win, unless you have overwhelming force. And even then, she might still win. But what you can do is use the advantage of the Ot Resolve against her one army to win. It's very rare that this happens, I should point out. The vast majority of times in Warhammer 3, when we're talking about Ot Resolve versus manual battles, you typically want to fight battles manually, when you're, you're the attacker specifically. On the defensive, if an enemy is assaulting your settlement and they have an overwhelming force, might be better to out-resolve. But when you're conquering territory, for the most part, it is better to, uh, it is better to fight things manually. It'll take fewer casualties, you'll get better results, you'll get more experience, etc., etc. Unless... Um, Unless you you have an army and you don't want it to flee, then auto-resolving it might be worth it because auto-resolve will completely eliminate the army you're facing. They won't flee after it. So there, that those are the pros and cons. But certainly the Warriors of Chaos are in this kind of situation where 
fighting a manual battle against them might actually be a bad decision in campaign. And that's unique, I should point out. Like, if you go up against Azazel, Archeon, Bellacor in manual battle, chances are, even if you win, you're going to be brutalized through that particular fight. And that, again, that doesn't happen. It's because of the sheer level of power that, by the way, is not reflected in their auto-resolve result. It's not like their auto-resolve result is easy, I might add. Like, you sh you have Bellacor with a full stack of units showing up on your shores as a leaf and art. That is not an easy army to defeat in an auto-resolve, I should point out. But it's like, as crazy as it can be in uh, in AR, it's even crazier when you fight them in, in battle. Like, Nakari is also a legendary lord that has that situation, like, pretty crazy if you fight Nakari manually. More, e more easy to defeat and not resolve. Far more easy and not resolve, though, in Nakari's case. It's a great imbalance over there, far more so than it is for Warriors of Chaos. Okay, so that's another benefit you have in your campaign. And then on top of that, you have the vassals, because you will always start with at least one vassal uh, in every campaign besides Festus, and it's not like Festus has any shortage of vassals he can get access to. But every Warriors of Cast campaign will get one of these minor Norskan vassals that will produce a stack. It might be a stack of crappy units, but it's still a stack of troops. It does count for something. And the AI is going to be able to use that stack to fight your enemy. And so you, you've got a mobile defense force in your territory that may not stop the enemy, but will slow them down. Attacking Warriors of Chaos is really frustrating as a result of that, this, because one, they've got Chaos Corruption in their territory, so, they're, so your replenishment won't be great, or you'll be taking attrition. Uh, then, typically speaking, Warriors of Chaos, where they start, are in such formidable defensive positions on a campaign map, especially in Chaos Wastes. You're, which is generally uninhabitable, so you're going to struggle moving there, you're going to struggle with replenishment, you have to fight for their armies, for their vassal armies, to reach their dark for fortress, and at the end of all of it, you have a difficult siege. Yeah, that's why Warriors of Chaos are so powerful. That's one of the reasons. They're difficult to defeat. They're not necessarily so much of a threat when they go on the offensive, although if Archeon shows up with a full stack of high-ranking units, uh, yeah, GG with that, more or less. Um, but eliminating them can be a genuine nightmare in a campaign because there are fortresses, the defensive positions they have, their vassals, and the terrain that you generally have to deal with. The exception to this is Festus, and, well, Festus has plagues to throw, uh, throw against you, so while he doesn't have the cast wasteland to back him up, he's got the love of Nurgle to back him up, which is, in quite a few ways, even more annoying than dealing with the cast wastes and will slow him down is a great dynamic that Carl Franz has to deal with in his campaign. And just keep in mind, all I'm talking about here are like vassals and dark fortresses. We haven't even gotten to their economy, to their units, to their lords, their heroes. Yeah, things get even crazier when you start talking about that. Another benefit the Warriors of Cast have are the Gifts of Cast. These are faction-wide effects that can give you significant benefits. For uh, Bellacor in particular is the king of this. Archeon is also a king in respect to this. Uh, the reason Bellacor and Archeon stand out, Bellacor uh, using these gifts costs souls. Archeon gets a lot of souls per turn, especially with the more vassals he has. Whereas Bellacor starts with all of the gifts of cast from the various gods. So Archeon doesn't only starts with Undivided. He will have two slots in Undivided, but he only starts with that. Bellacor starts with all four of them. And while not all of them are worth it, like I think Slanesh and Siege uh, are significantly worse, it, though, uh, worse than that, but they still still can give you some decent units, like Seeker Chariots as a charge unit. Yeah, that's uh, that's not um, that's not the joke, suffice to say. There are some useful units to have here, not Demonets, though. Uh, and also Campaign Movement Range, if you're willing to pay a 15% upkeep cost, can absolutely be worth it. Siege less so, it's, you're mostly going to go with Siege for the sake of the units. Maybe worth playing at attacks over here. But with regards to Gift of Cats, Nurgle, you can get 75 growth after winning a battle to own regions. You can get a replenishment in foreign territory. You can get Missile Resistance for all units who mark some Nurgle. But you will start with 75 growth for each battle you win. That is... Um, that's pretty crazy. Um, then you have corn. Now corn can give you character experience, can give you blood letters, or it can give you death's bounty, which is the one I'm using, which increases the uh, income from post-battle loot by 35%. 
and an income from raising by 35%, which I would not recommend using it uh, because you know, you are you will gain more money if you sack a settlement, take it over, sell it to someone, as opposed to raising it to the ground and rebuilding it. So I don't think that's worth it. The post battle loot money absolutely is though. Um, and yeah, undivided, undivided is uh, insane. So you start with ruinous bulwark, which gives you the ability of breaking down walls. Yes, warriors of chaos are great at laying siege to settlements because they open more entry points in a in in a settlement by blasting a wall with two ability usage. So you can blast down two walls and 15% missile resistance. So range mass range armies don't work so well against warriors of chaos. It is a problem. And then later on, they get hell cannons. Also, if you're playing an Undivided Lord, you'll start with a Hell Cannon through the Gifted Unit's uh, mechanic. You'll start with one. So that is a ridiculous level of power that you have for the Gifts of Chaos. And then eventually, with Undivided, you get the greater demons of all types. So you can get Blood first, uh, Firsters, Great Unclean Ones, uh, Soul Grinders, Lords of Change, etc., etc. There's a level of power through the Gifted Units. Even if there's a limit of Gifted Units, Bellacord doesn't have it. Even if there is a limit of Gifted Units, it's not like your regular Mortal Army is, uh, e is weak. It's not. That's the thing. These Gifted Units are on top of your regular unit roster. Now, there is a downside, of course, of Warriors Cast, and the reason they're slower to build up in a campaign. And that's because they won't recruit like Warriors of Chaos or Chosen directly. They might recruit a couple, but more often than not, you're going to recruit Marauders, Marauder Horsemen, Spawn, Castrols, and Forsaken. But let me be blunt in saying this. Marauders, Marauder Horsemen, Castrols, they're pretty good early game units, sure. Some of them might be too expensive, though Marauders are certainly cheap, but certainly will get the job done. Like over here, keep in mind, I defeat it, defeat it Malice Darkblade, Yon Bo and Manfred with this army in particular. Well, these two armies in particular. There's a level of power. And then there's the unit customization. So you can use Marauders with great weapons. Oh, I also forgot. Uh, I, I defeat, uh, defeated the Lizardman over here. Irrelevant. Uh, I don't even care about the Lizardman. It's like, oh, you just fight one battle. That's it. And then you deal with the vassal that uh, they have who doesn't have even uh, any armies. Anyway. Um, you have the unit customization. Now, this is great not just because you can, oh, turn Marauders into Warriors of Chaos. No, it's great because, let's say you're fighting a melee-centric army, like Lizardmen, or maybe Grimgor, or Manfred. Oh, you can go with Marauder or Grey Weapons. Dealing with a lot of range units, go with regular Marauders. Same with Chaos Warriors, Chaos Warriors with Grey Weapons. You can get Cavalry. There's enormous benefits with this system, not just in the fact that you can take your starting units, upgrade them into higher rank units, which is an amazing system that I would recommend using the Warband Upgrade mod for every campaign that you play in the entire game. It makes the game far more fun to play because it gives you army versatility. You will have cavalry. You will have, well, as much range units as the Warriors of Chaos do have. You will have various types of melee infantry and switch them up whenever you want for a particular situation. Dealing with a lot of infantry, go with gray weapons. Dealing with a lot of cavalry, go with halberds. Dealing with a lot of um, missile troops, go with shields. And same with the same idea with the cavalry. Also the upgrades. You have an enormous vers uh, an, uh, you have enormous versatility in your roster. And even the basic units like armored castrols are not weak units. They're powerful units. You can get them very easily. Like you might recruit uh, you might recruit a unit of castrols in your campaign, but you only need rank free with those castrols in order to upgrade them from regular castrols into armored castrols. And armored castrols, they have great armor, leadership, good amount of damage, sharp bonus isn't so great, but they do have siege attacker. So it, you end up with a ridiculous level of strength of your army, and then you ultimately go for chosen in this campaign and eventually aspiring champions. Yeah, there's an incredible level of power and that's just the baseline undivided units. Then you have things like Korn, Nurgle. Nurgle has the best and most powerful infantry. Like Chosen and Nurgle with great weapons are the most powerful melee on melee infantry in the entire game. That's not even a joke. Uh, Slanish has speed, so Slanish has Chaos Knights of Slanish. Now the benefit of Chaos Knights of Slanish is that, or specifically Chaos 
uh, cast Knights of Celestial Alliances, their charge bonus is 60. But they also have Devastating Flanker, which doubles it. So you're looking at 120 charge bonus. Probably the best charge cavalry in the entire freaking game over here, or one of the best charge cavalry in the entire game right there, if you get the flank attack with them. There's a level of insanity that you can get with this roster, especially as Undivided. But even the Mono Gods, they're certainly not weak. Well, I'm not as big of a fan of, say, Slanish overall, because the infantry roster of Slanish is not quite as gr good. But honestly, even Slanish, like, you can make any of them work. Like, the durability of Tsinch, the speed and charge bonus of Slanish, it does work. And crucially, you have a lot of units minus the lesser demons like blood letters plague bearers all that but you have a lot of units in the roster that are heavily armored units you may play an entire warriors of cast campaign and be able to out resolve and win every battle or the vast majority of them once you get an army like this no one will be able to stop you get a lot of money from dark fortresses eventually you get a lot of money from your vassals Keep in mind, Old World is slower pace. I only have two Dark Fortresses in Immortal Empires. I probably have like seven by this particular point, maybe even a dozen, depending on how, how aggressive I want it to be. Just the different pacing of Old World versus Immortal Empires. Oh, and maybe just going to point out, um, dealing with uh, the Thunderdome here in Albion is certainly not a fast process. It's easy as the Warriors of Chaos because of Warriors of Chaos, but still. Uh, then on top of that, you have customization, not just for uh, you have customization not just for your units, but for your heroes with the various uh, devotees to God, Slanesh and Siege for casters, Nurgle and Corn for your uh, for your me um, melee heroes, and same with uh, with uh, with uh, your lords. Like make one a demon if you want, a demon prince if you want, uh, in uh, in your campaign those are the options that you have available and there's an enormous level of power for the customization for the versatility of the armies the sheer strength of individual armies the great auto result result and to capital off when to capital off there's powerful magic powerful hero like there's only two heroes but they're incredibly powerful. Like exalted heroes are really good in melee go and offer good faction effects as well. They give you replenishment. It's not as great of a replenishment as a dedicated replenishment hero, but it's still five percent replenishment. Keep in mind, you don't just have five percent replenishment with warriors of chaos, because you also have authority. So, for instance, here Bellicor is generating ten percent casualty replenishment for undivided units of which the vast majority of his army is made up of undivided units. The only ones that aren't are the couple of demons that I do have that I might look to replace. But even for the others, there's still a benefit to casualty replenishment. So you have uh, you have the ability of getting replenishment, you have the ability of reducing the armor of enemy armies and province, and other benefits as well. There's a level of power with just two hero types and two lord types that you just don't have. And they... they can be customized in a lot of ways. So powerful in battle, powerful on the campaign. That is what uh, the Warriors of Chaos have to offer. And the final point, Regiments of Renown. Holy shit. Keep in mind, this is a faction that excels at fighting with just a couple of armies. Vast majority of factions, the meta in Warhammer 3 is fighting with a lot of armies. Warriors of Chaos has, have so powerful individual armies that even though you have fewer troops, uh, you, or even though you have fewer armies on the field, uh, field at least early on, later on you'll have as many as anyone else. Uh, certainly not on the level of Skaven or Greenskins, but still, you'll have plenty. But the level of power in each individual army is absurd. The sheer number of regiments of renown is insane. And this is just with two DLCs, because you basically had the Warriors of Chaos race pack, which came out in Warhammer 1, then you had the Champions of Chaos, you have one of the largest rosters of, of um, you, you have one of the largest rosters of regiments right now in the entire game. So forget recruiting, upgrading units. No, you can just make a, an army of regiments right now, and it will be pretty damn devastating. Like things like the Severing Claw that you can get early on in Miragard, pretty damn powerful as well in a campaign. That is why Warriors of Chaos are powerful. Personally, I admit I don't like playing them. Not because I don't think they're uh, they're badly designed. No, they're great, well designed. 
but they're so far ahead of everyone else because of vassals, economy, army, power of their armies, faction effects, lord effects, that they steamroll the campaign map. They're a faction that makes everyone else seem irrelevant in a campaign. They're a faction, they're a race that can vassalize vast majority of other factions on a campaign map one way or another. That is the level of power that Warriors of Chaos do have in their campaigns. Kwasin here, signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. Stay tuned for more.